All right, let's turn in our Bibles, please, to the book of Hebrews and chapter 9. We're going to go to Hebrews 9 today. Before we leave chapter 8, however, let's look back at the last two verses of chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. God said, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, Israel, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, A new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to banish away. And we discussed the fact that God promises to one day have a covenant with the nation of Israel in which no one will have to witness or testify about God because he'll be universally known around the world. Uh, no one will have to teach God's laws because they will be in men's hearts and their minds and they'll have no excuse for not knowing them. Uh, and this will be the blessing throughout all of planet Earth. Colossians 2, verse 17, tells us that things such as meat and drinks and holy days and new moons and the Sabbath days are, quote, uh, um, a shadow of things to come. Excuse me, I lost my train of thought there. And if you study the book of Ezekiel, and specifically chapters 40 all the way through 48, you'll find that some of the covenant practices given back in Exodus and Leviticus will be uh, restored once again in the millennium of Jesus Christ. Repeated might be a better word. We won't dwell on this um, subject today, but there are three quote-unquote old covenants uh, given to Israel in the Bible. And let me list them for you quickly. The first was that described in the book of Exodus. All the laws and commandments revealed to the nation of Israel through Moses. And then secondly, there are the laws and commandments which come back when Israel wants to go back to a temple worship and animal sacrifice during the tribulation. Um, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 12, 17. Of course, those who are in the tribulation only worshiping God through sacrifices and um, temple worship without Jesus Christ, of course, will uh, gain nothing. They'll benefit nothing. They'll be prey for the Antichrist. But some in the tribulation will seek to keep the commandments of God as revealed through Moses, uh, all the Ten Commandments, and have the faith of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, God, or Moses told the Israelites, Deuteronomy 6.25, And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. But, and that had to be kept all the way up until death. Ezekiel 18 says, um, uh, Whoso um, break the law um, and turn it away from these commandments, all his righteousness which he had done before shall not be mentioned. In his sin and in his iniquity which he had done, in them shall he die. So that had to be maintained up until death. And John the Baptist's parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, Luke 1, verses 5 and 6, it says, they were both righteous. How? Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. They were still living in Old Testament times. That's how someone's righteousness before God was established and measured. By the degree of obedience he had given, he gave to the commandments and laws God had revealed. But even then, Isaiah says, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Alongside the perfect righteousness of God, man's righteousness amounts to nothing. But that was nevertheless the, the system God had given man to follow and obey. In the New Testament, Paul says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, Titus 3, 5. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And so there's a great difference between an Old Testament plan of salvation and New Testament plan of salvation. 
In the Old Testament, a man's righteousness was measured by his degree of obedience to the commandments and the keeping of the law. In the New Testament, it has been trusting uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and his saving merit alone. His blood shed on the cross of Calvary to cover your sins and your guilt by faith. Amen. Without you doing anything. But in the tribulation, following both of those great systems, it'll be a combination of both faith and works. Mm -hmm. Now, if anyone says, well, you can hear, I guarantee you, you could call the Calvary Chapel uh, radio station and their pastor's perspective program and ask any one of the Calvary Chapel ministers after the rapture, how will someone be saved after the rapture? And I guarantee you, their answer is going to be by trusting in Jesus Christ, just like you and I trust in Him now. That's how everyone is saved, by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And of course, to keep from persecution, you, or, or uh, and also, you necess it's necessary to avoid the Antichrist and not get your head chopped off uh, if you don't have the mark. That'll be a separate matter, but salvation comes through trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if salvation comes it will come in the tribulation by the same means, the same um, vehicle that salvation comes to the Christian now, then, then the tribulation is effectively just a continuation of the church age, right? Because nothing has changed. It leaves no room for the rapture to take place. After the rapture takes place, then is a whole different set of rules. Uh, it's amazing how shallow a lot of so-called preachers are in the Bible. That's very basic. I gave you three or four verses to lay it out in a very simple, understandable way. But a lot of radio preachers are pretty shallow in the Bible. Um, so the commandments uh, come back in, in effect uh, at some degree during the tribulation when the Jew wants to live under those rules. And then thirdly, uh, a part of that old covenant comes back into effect during the millennium. Uh, apparently not to receive forgiveness of sins, but as an act of worship of Jesus Christ. Has no other purpose than to show your devotion and worship of Jesus Christ. Uh, it is not to affect salvation or to cover your sins by the animals. Those things are done away with by the Lord Jesus Christ. They will come back uh, nevertheless. Uh, there are also three new covenants in the Bible. Number one, there's a covenant given to sinners for salvation uh, through the shed blood of Christ. Nothing else is required, which we just mentioned a moment ago. Secondly, there's a covenant uh, to the houses of Israel and Judah, both of them, representing the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, found in the Old Testament, the book of Second uh, Samuel and First and Second Kings. Uh, they will be united, and they're, today, there's not a Jew in the world who knows which tribe he's from. But God knows. Okay. And, and those things that we can't fully discern or figure out, many times you just have to leave it with God. He knows a lot more about someone's identity of the ans their ancestors than they know. He knows more about you and I than we know about ourselves. Sure. But uh, so that'll come back into effect. They're both restored uh, and their identities are renewed. And then thirdly, there's a covenant pertaining to the rightful ownership of the land here in the earth. Go back to the book of Isaiah 66. This will take place in the new heaven and the new earth even after the millennium. Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. And let's begin there with verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. So when someone says God's all finished with the Jew, the natural question is, well then why are there still Jews? <laughs> if God has no more benefit, no more blessing, no more promise to fulfill to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even if they don't know which tribe they're descended from, 
uh, something inside them tells them they're Jews. So even if they don't know, um, there's no reason they should still exist because whole armies and whole governments have sought to destroy the Jew and wipe him off the face of the earth. Whole nations have risen and fallen, and those nations and kingdoms sought to uh, destroy the Jew, to eliminate the Jew, to wipe him off the face of the earth. Those kingdoms have disappeared, but the Jew continues. Amen. And he says, the Jew is going to continue even after the millennium in the new heavens and the new earth. Verse 23, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So there's going to be a, a pit out there. We take that to be literal. There's going to be a pit out there, probably south of uh, uh, Jerusalem, down there near the area uh, of the Dead Sea, perhaps. And there'll be a uh, fire there, and all those who have rebelled against Jesus Christ uh, in the millennium, following the millennium, will be there burning, and people will go out and watch them burn, and see them burn. And they're going to be in agony. Their fire shall not be quenched, and the worm shall not die. But um, Along those lines, go to the book of Zechariah, in the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah, before that time comes, the new heaven and new earth, during the millennium, before that time, look what God says in Zechariah 14, or rather, yeah, Zechariah 14, and... Start at verse 19. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them, and see therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. The Canaanite would be the equivalent of talking about Arabs and Muslims. They're descended from Canaan. They're descended from the Egyptian uh, son of Noah. He had three sons, Japheth, Shem and Ham. Uh, Japheth representing the Caucasian races that went westward, the European Isles. Uh, Shem representing all the Asiatic races. And Ham, who went south and had the entire African continent. And those respective racial identities. Uh, and then there's been a lot of mixing between the Hamitic peoples and the Shemitic peoples, producing the Arab nations. And they became hostile enemies of, of the Jew ever since God blessed Abraham with Isaac and rejected Ishmael. And they claimed the land of, it was called the land of Canaan because their people were living in the land when God brought Israel in. And God told them, wipe them all out, kick them all out. God didn't want them there. He gave that land to Abraham, Isaac, and their descendants, the Jews. And Israel failed to drive them all out. Instead, they rebelled against God. They sinned time and time again. And these nations, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Hivites, and all the other ites you find listed in the book of First and Second Kings, they came against the Jew, and it was just constant warfare, back and forth, back and forth. And then along comes Muhammad in the, I think, the 600s, and starts the religion of Islam, claiming that uh, Ishmael was their rightful father, 
and their ancestor, and God's blessings were intended for Ishmael, not for Isaac. So this whole um, counterfeit religion, trying to undo the blessings that the Jew had had, and they've been jealous of the Jew ever since. Jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of judgment, Proverbs 6, uh, 34 says. So they've been jealous of the Jew, and they claim that land belongs to them. They don't recognize the state of Israel as being legitimate. They claim it's the occupied territory of, of interlopers and invaders that say it's been taken over by a hostile force. And yet, uh, uh, Muslims are, many Muslims are breaking their neck wanting to live in Israel under the rule of the Jew, under the rule of Israel, or the Israeli government. They don't want to live in their own countries. Their own countries are uh, you know, just barren, worthless, producing very little that the rest of the world is clamoring for. But God says one day they're not going to be there. He's going to kick them out. <laughs> that land doesn't belong to them. It belongs to the Jew. Yeah. And that'll come even before the millennium. All right, back to Hebrews. And uh, let's now move into chapter 9 and read the first five verses there. Hebrews 9 and verses 1 through 5. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. These verses deal with the contents of the holy place, the first room in the tabernacle, and the holiest of all, the, the holy of holies, the second room. And verse 1 mentions ordinances, and says a worldly sanctuary, that is the tabernacle was down here on the earth, on the ground. Verse 2 says, a tabernacle, and it says the first, referring to the first room of the tabernacle, called the holy place. Um, run forward quickly to Matthew chapter 24. Or backwards, rather. Matthew 24. Notice what Christ says there in verse 15. When he therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So that's where the um, image of the man of sin will be, will be put in the rebuilt temple. Um, the holy place contained the golden candlestick, and you walk and went in the holy place, that the first room, the golden candlestick, straight ahead. Off to your right, you see the showbread of uh, 12 loaves of bread made, made new every day, one representing each tribe of Israel. And off to the left, or I'm sorry, off to the left was the candlestick, and straight ahead was the uh, altar of incense in that first room. Uh, verse 3 uh, rather, the first room, that was also called the sanctuary there in verse 2. Both of them are referred to as the tabernacle because the tabernacle contained both rooms. But one was called the sanctuary or the holy place. The other was called the holiest of all or the most holy place. Verse 3 says, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. That being a reference to the second room where the Ark of the Covenant was kept and uh, the mercy seat on top of it said to be behind the veil. Look back at chap uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6 and verse 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, 
made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The holiest place was a glimpse of the third heaven itself, uh, the dwelling place of God. And it was in the Holy of Holies that the high priest would enter every year um, and commune with God and receive instruction from God uh, and, and present himself on behalf of the nation to God. And God would speak to the high priest from between the two cherubims on top of the mercy seat. But Christ is called our high priest. So he offered himself. In Hebrews chapter 2, back in Hebrews 2, and verse 17 says, Wherefore in all things, yeah, fat fingers here. Wherefore in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And chapter 3, and verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. And also chapter 10, chapter 10, and verses 1 through four. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the cumbers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. That is, if the animal sacrifices could give you eternal life uh, by, can, by constantly doing them, then uh, they'd still be offered. But because of the Lord Jesus, animal sacrifices are, are no longer uh, effective. They can no longer affect any forgiveness uh, by you. They couldn't provide eternal life when they were mandated by God, and uh, nor can they now. Um, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereon too perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. If the animal sacrifice could bring you eternal life, then uh, once the animal was sacrificed, you didn't need to do it again. But it couldn't provide eternal life. It could provide forgiveness for that sin, and that's as far as it could go. You had to bring another sacrifice the next time you sin. Verse 3, But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So the animal's offering was uh, effective to bring forgiveness to the sinner of that sin, but it couldn't take away his sin from his record. It was still there. And uh, Hebrews 9, verse 22, later on will say, uh, there, without shedding of blood there is no remission meaning the animal sacrifices. So the animal sacrifices would forgive the sin at that moment, but it didn't clear you as a sinner. You were still a sinner. It's kind of like someone who has a cancer uh, diagnosis, and suddenly the doctors discover that seemed to be in remission. It's not growing. It's not spreading. They might not be able to explain it, but it's not increasing in the, in the patient's body. But it's not gone either. And so what you need is for that sin to be taken away completely and your record to be clear. And so in John 1 verse 29, John the Baptist sees Christ and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. That's what you needed. And only Christ could bring it about. Yes. Um, <clears throat> now, then verse 4 describes the contents of the most holy place. Let's read Hebrews 9 verse 4 again. Well, verses 4 and 5. Which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. Those are the Ten Commandments. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. Now, believe it or not, <clears throat> there's some modern Bible 
correctors, modern Bible critics, who have conflated the golden censer mentioned there, verse 4, with the altar of incense, as if they were both the same thing. They were one and the same. And therefore, they conjectured that the altar of incense uh, was not in the first room, but was inside the second room. Or that this is a mistake in the Bible when we all know that the altar of incense was in the first room, the holy place. Now, either way, they're, they're not paying attention to the scriptures. If, if this was a mistake, then it's not a perfect book, right? If there's even one mistake, one provable, demonstrable mistake in your Bible, then it's not a perfect Bible. The presence of one mistake would constitute an imperfect Bible. And if there's one mistake in your Bible, it can't be the words of God. Uh, if God's going to write a book, wouldn't we expect it to be completely perfect from cover to cover? Amen. And the reason we, we like to point out all the mistakes and the doctrinal errors in the modern versions is because they're plainly not the words of God. You know, they say, well, it's a Bible. It's got all the books of the Bible in it. Yeah, but you can't, Dr. Ruckman used to say, you can't sell a, a basket of rotten apples unless you put a few good ones on top. Right? <laughs> so there's just enough truth in there to make some customer at a Christian bookstore think that he's buying a Bible. He's buying poison. Ken Hoven talks about um, rat poison is 99% good food. It's just 1% of poison that'll kill the rat. The rest of it is just to attract the rat's, the rat's appetite. And he eats the, the food, not knowing he's, he's killing himself. That's how I view the modern Bibles, modern version of the Bible. I'll never forget, I'll get back to this in a minute, but when my wife and I were first married, we, we didn't even have any kids, that's how long ago, it was over 30 years ago. We went to a, guy in his, a guy's house out in Fontana. He lived out in the country, right south of the 10. I think that probably is all developed with housing, housing now. He and his wife lived out there, and he had, I think we had a dirt road to get to their house, and they invited us for dinner. And I had met this minister during my day job, and I thought he was a pretty decent guy. And we went into his house and had dinner, and kids were nice, and all homeschooled. And, really, you know, washing all the dishes without being told to, and they'd do their chores, and, and they seemed like a great family. And then after dinner, this guy wanted to talk about Bible um, doctrines, and he turned out to be one of these uh, hyper, what we call the hyper dispensationalists, didn't think the church began until Paul was saved, and the revelation given to Paul, so it didn't begin prior to that. And they slice and dice the Bible up so much, they don't think water baptism is necessary today, they don't think the Lord's Supper is uh, necessary today, but, uh, but be that as it, and they don't, they're one of those groups that we don't believe in calling ourselves Baptists or Methodists or having any denomination, and then we just call ourselves Christians. We meet in homes and we meet in places. But then we got to talk about the Bible translations, and I was just new to this. I, I hadn't really been studying it that much. I knew that I believed the King James Bible was the Word of God, but I hadn't really learned much about it yet. And I brought that up and I said, you know what, I think the King James Bible is uh, the Word of God from cover to cover. And I don't think it's my job to try to second guess it or change it or modify it or adjust it or improve it or anything. And he didn't agree with that. He had some other version of the Bible. He didn't agree with that position. At least 20 years later, 20 years later, I was over at the L.A. County Fair one year walking through one of those buildings, all the little booths and the vendors selling their wares. And I saw this booth that had a big, uh, looked like a dispensational Bible chart. I thought well, maybe this was Clarence Larkin stuff or Schofield stuff. And so I walked up to the booth and talked to the guy behind the booth. Turns out it was this man. Of course, he had gotten gray, and I, it took me a minute to recognize who he was. And I had to remind him who I was. First question out of his mouth was, so you're still believing, still believing in the King James Bible? I said, well, it's still the Word of God. <laughs> and, um, and I said, you know, in the NIV, the, the Bible says, Luke 2, verse 33, Joseph and his mother marvel at those things which were spoken about Christ in the temple. I said, the NIV 
says, his father and mother marveled at those things, thus calling Joseph Christ's father. I mean, I know Christ, that Joseph wasn't Christ's father. The Holy Spirit was Christ's father. Um, that which is conceived in thee is of the Holy Ghost, Matthew 1 tells us. And uh, surely the Holy Spirit who inspired the scriptures knew who Christ's father was. He wouldn't cause um, Luke to write, Joseph was Christ's father. I said, that's a, that's a blatant doctrinal mistake. That undermines the deity of Jesus Christ. That undermines the virgin birth. And we didn't have much else to say after that. I walked away. And I was walking away. I looked over my shoulder. And he turned around. He was scrambling, looking through his Bible to see if I was right or not. Because he had an NIV on the counter. <laughs> he got a rude awakening when he discovered I was right. So... Thank God we have a Bible we can have absolute confidence in. Yeah. Never have to yeah. doubt or second guess it. Our job isn't to change, our job is to believe it. Amen. That's right. But why that's so difficult for people? Just believe that it's a perfect book, and now the Holy Spirit is your teacher to lead and guide, help you compare Scripture with Scripture as you read it. Let the Scriptures interpret themselves along the way. But, so these guys think that the censor uh, is the same as the altar of incense. They're not. How they could mistake those two things is a mystery. Go, if you will, back to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Second Chronicles 26. Notice there verse 19. 2 Chronicles 26, verse 19. Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. A censer and an altar are two different things. They're two different words in English. <clears throat> the, the altar was a fixed place they would put incense in and let the smoke rise and the smoke was a type of the prayers of the people going up to God. The censer was an object <clears throat> with which you'd get hot coals from the altar of the, the sacrifice and take it in there and put it in with the, the incense that had been uh, compounded and thus create the, the smoke. It was something you'd walk around with and so they, they, they how they couldn't find the difference between censer and the altar of incense. I mean, welcome to Laodicea. People are so shallow in the Bible. It's amazing. Go back to the book of Numbers, chapter 4. Numbers 4. Numbers 4, and verse 14. And they shall put upon it all the vessels thereof, wherewith they minister about it, even the censers, the flesh hooks, and the shovels, and the basins, all the vessels of the altar, they shall spread it upon it, a covering of badger skins, and put to the stabs of it. This is how they would pack up the stuff when they were tearing down the, the uh, tabernacle and moving it from place to place. Go, if you will, to Numbers 16. Number 16, and notice there at verse 46. <clears throat> and Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord, the plague is begun. The censer was obviously an object to pick up hot coals uh, or hot fire from the altar of sacrifice, and go in and put it into the altar of the incense and ignite it so that the smoke would begin to rise. One more verse, Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. And I think verse 12. No, verse 11. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering 
which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. This is what Aaron offered as the high priest on behalf of the nation. The censer and the altar of incense were not the same object. They're two separate words, two separate things. So when it says the censer was kept inside the second veil, the holiest of holies, that's not the altar of incense. The altar of incense was outside that veil in the first room. How someone could be so ignorant and write commentaries about that and suggest that there's a mistake in the translation uh, is, is, beside you, is beside me. I don't know how someone could be so stupid with the Bible. They're reckless and they're careless when they read the Bible, careless when they handle it, careless when they think they're interpreting it or writing commentaries on it. It's great to be a Bible believer because you let the Bible teach you rather than you trying to teach God. <laughs> I suppose that's the best way to put it. We're going to stop right there. I think I'm going to have to come back to this section. We're not quite finished with these first, first five verses. We'll come back to this next week, Lord willing. So let's pray and conclude for today.